Will you stand on your feet again one more time and give God some praise? Didn't he wake you up this morning? Didn't he start you on your way? Didn't he make a way out of no way? It might not be like you wanted, but ain't you all right? Ain't you in your right mind this morning? Ain't you walking on your feet? It's all right. And we just got two verses this morning, and it's Romans 12, 1 and 2, and it says, Therefore I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of service or worship. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is the good and perfect, acceptable will of God. You may be seated. Let me switch microphones. Up. Got me? One, two, one, two. Coming down a little bit. We good. This is revival, y'all. And Pastor said this is a revival problem. This is the first day of our revival. And so in preparing this message, I, I, by way of introduction, I just want to make a few comments. I ain't got but four points, and if you give me your attention, this ought to be a, a great jumping off lesson for us this morning. Uh, but re revival, what, what does that mean? Some, sometimes I, I think perhaps many of us don't consider what that means. A lot of us, especially us black folk, we tend to think it's just another opportunity to, to meet and sing and shout the preacher, you know, and, feel good and run up down the aisles, and that's, that's, that has its place. But essentially, revival just means to be quickened, to be refreshed, to be renewed, right? To be reawakened. And so, it also suggests to me, as I thought about it, if we ought to be revived, that suggests that we had to be vibed to begin with. So see, revival is for folks that's already been revived. Are y'all following me? And so uh, if, if you've been vibed back then, the next thing I thought about, is there really a need to be revived? And I would always hear, you know, people in my, in my midst and old folk, you know, young folk preachers, well, you know, if you say, brother, you don't need to be revived. You know, because, uh, you know, uh, Christ came to give you life and that you might have life abundance of what you need to be revived for. And so I said, well, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good point of view. But when you live this life, sometimes, as pastor's been saying this past several years, sometimes life will literally choke the life out of you. You ever seen somebody have to be revived when they're unconscious? And unfortunately, sometimes we walk through this life and life literally chokes the consciousness out of us. And so we live our lives, we come and go to church, and you know, and we do all this, the church stuff, but totally unconscious, totally unvibed. <laughs> so the question is, uh, is there a need for revival? Well, you know, some folks say no, some folks say yeah, but I, I just say if you want those folk on the other end, just keep living and be honest with yourself. <laughs> keep on going to church and you'll find that the church itself ain't got the answer for you. <laughs> As great as pastor is, pastor ain't got the answer for you. He can point you to the answer. So, so I would say if all of us are honest with ourselves, we do need to be revived. And so is there any biblical precedence for revival? Yeah, there is. Uh, a, cu a couple of scriptures that I like that, uh, that, that helps me stand firm knowing that revival is necessary. And by the way, let's not keep on getting revival twisted with programs and services. I'm, I'm calling no name, but I'm saying many of us have been around long enough. We've been to revival after revival after camp meeting after camp meeting, and we come out feeling funny with goosebumps and right back where we started. So let's not get real revival twisted with services. And so if we're going to be revived today. Let's just be a jumping off point for us to get our mind right. And so uh, we do have biblical precedence for revival. In 2 Chronicles, we know this. Most preachers use this as a revival text. I'm not using it this morning, but I want to mention it. He says, if I, my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear their land. That sounds like something happened along the way where their land got sick and jacked up. 
that are like Psalm 85. Will you not revive us again? That your people might rejoice within you? Something happened when you become unvived along the way. <laughs> then Psalm 19 said, the law of the Lord is perfect. Doing what? Reviving the soul. And one of my favorites is Psalms 51. In verse 10 it says, created me a clean heart, O God, and what? Renew a right spirit within me. So somewhere along the way, you can argue with yourself or how you got there, but somewhere along the way your spirit got all jacked up and cluttered up and choked up. And you need God to reawaken you. Yeah. Acts chapter 3, 19 and 20 says, Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Why? That the times of refreshing may come. We get so bogged down and rolled up and messed up in sin that we get weighed down by sin. So you need to be revived. You need to be raised up out of this stuff so you can be effective. Ephesians 3, 19 and 20 says, Therefore it says, Awake, O ye sleeper. Y'all catch that? Awake has to do deal with you being, uh, being conscious. Think about it. We go to church week in and week out. Revival meeting after revival meeting. I've seen some churches have a revival camp meeting up all the year. Well, dog, at some point, either you're going to be revived or you're going to stay dead, you know? <laughs> so the point is, if you're going to be revived, there's an awakening that has to happen. So my, my, four, my little four-point argument today, if you just follow me, we'll be done in a minute. Uh, Christ came that, that we might have life and to have life abundantly. Did y'all catch that? And so it ought to beg the question for us, if I'm a Christian, what does it mean to have abundant life and then why am I not experiencing it? Did y'all catch that? So, so in short, my, my message title is an abundant life is a kingdom life. To live an abundant life means to live a kingdom life. And I got news for you, to live an abundant life is probably not what many of us want it to mean. Oftentimes we start on the back end. Well, you know, I am the head and not the tail. Yes, you are. I'm a child of the king. When praises go up, blessings come down. That's certainly true. But the abundant life, as you seek the kingdom, starts out with being a servant life. And see, if you're going to say amen, you should have said it right there. Living an abundant life means you start out giving yourself away to God as a servant. We sing the song, we get happy and we cry, and oh God, I give myself away, you know. But we just sang the song. So I, I want to argue with you today in four little points that an abundant life is, an, is a kingdom life. And we'll find in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul was trying to argue and plead with those Christians at Rome that they kind of need to have a shift in their thinking too. Yeah. And I also might add that the abundant life unto service life is not a life out of obligation. We just sung the song, I will bless the Lord at all times, for he is good. If the Lord has really been good to you, what do you think your response should be? To live a life of service. Let me just be real with you. Many of us come to church, so I need to, oh, I just, I'm so depressed. I need to get something from God. Oh, I just, I just, oh, I just need to experience God today. But if you live in the abundant life, what about bringing God with you and giving something? <laughs> Y'all don't like that, but that's okay. <laughs> and so we're going to uh, visit Paul's basis for this plea in just a second. But the first point I want to make to you, in living this abundant life, Unto service, Paul lays out something in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, uh, this, that he says we should consider. If you're really going to begin to live the abundant life, particularly uh, a kingdom life, particularly that kingdom and abundant life, they're synonymous. A kingdom life and the abundant life is the same. And if you're really going to begin to experience that and live that and give your life as a means of service unto God, Paul is saying that there's, there's a couple things you just have to consider. Uh, and you, you can't work, work yourself up into this thing. And the first thing he says, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. And why, why, is that in, why is that important? Well, there's a couple of things that came to mind as I was preparing for this. It's important that when he says, I beseech you, that kind of set the whole tone for chapter 12, at least those first three or four verses. That's an admonition. He, he's begging you. Kind of like I'm doing this morning. Please, y'all. I can't make you do it. 
Pastor can't make you do it. Jesus ain't going to come down and show himself and make you do it. I'm begging you to do it. That ought to be our motivation. You know, anything done out of obligation, out of coercion, that ain't no good. But God forbid, but perhaps you are coming to revival call. Well, you know, Pastor Charles, I need to come. Well, you know, it, this is what we do. So I, that, that, that ain't no good. The Apostle Paul is saying, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. He's making a strong request, almost as if he's begging. What's the basis of his begging, though? By the mercies of God. And we just sung just a moment ago, I'll bless the Lord at all times because he's good. And, and he laid out all those mercies of God back between chapter 1 through chapter 11. And we say it all the time, we come up here and stand, we told the Lord has been so good to me, oh, he's delivered me out of all my troubles and yada, yada, yada. And Paul is saying if that's real to you and you've experienced all these wonderful mercies, that ought to be the basis of you surrendering to God. Nothing and nothing less than that. He says, uh, so therefore, by the mercies of God, and what are some of those mercies that he talked about? I won't go back and read them all to you, but just to make the point so I can get out your way. In chapter 1, he starts out talking about how everybody has sinned. The whole world has sinned, including me and you. And wasn't nothing that could fix that other than what God was going to do through Christ. That ain't nothing but grace and mercy. In chapter 2, he admonished them that the law of circumcision don't make you right. Go ahead and come to church every Sunday, you know, kiss everybody on the cheek and say nice things. That don't make you right. You're only right through faith in Christ. That's grace and mercy. Chapter 3, he explained that the righteousness of the law was unable to give you only what you can get through Christ Jesus. Keeping the law don't make you righteous. <laughs> you have imputed righteousness through Christ Jesus. Chapter 4 talks about faith. Chapter 5 talks about how we are completely reconciled to God by faith in Christ. Did you not know before Christ you was an enemy of God? That's grace and mercy. Chapter 6 talks about, I love this, about your union with Christ. Did you not know that not only are you Christ's brother, you're not only a co heir with Christ, you are one with Christ? And, and, I, and, I, and I'll be, be candid with you. Many of us, including myself at one point, we live so unconscious of that fact that we are one with Christ, so we struggle unnecessarily hard to try to be Christ-like. And Paul was saying, but, but Christ already fixed that. Then chapter 7, he talks about how our union free, or our union with Christ freed up us, freed up us from the bondage of the law. It ain't about trying to, oh, just show it's hard to be a Christian, Jeff. I just try so hard to be good. Well, that's your fault. Why don't you just give yourself to Christ like you say and let him live his life through you? After all, you are one with Christ. In chapter 9, goes on to talk about, uh, it teaches us and assures us that Christ alone saves nothing else sufficient. In other words, the it fixes that where we are children of promise. All that God has promised us, all that God has for us, we got it already by Christ Jesus. Then chapter 11 teaches us that God's plan of salvation is, is sufficient for every man. So, and that's not an exhaustive list, but when he was writing a letter to the Romans, just like I'm trying to plead with you this morning, you have this and so much more whereby your proper response ought to be to give yourself to the Lord. It ought not be a, a means of, co yeah, we ought to invite folk. Pastor needs to challenge us. We need to do all these, these things that we do as Christian disciplines. But for God's sake, if you're going to live an abundant kingdom life, your point of reference, your motivation ought to be God's mercy and his grace. That's all he's saying there. And so having said that, in that motivation from God's great mercies and his, and his grace, we ought to understand that this, even though this is a plea, and he's begging, it's also a call. It's an imperative. It's not, well, when you feel like it or when they start treating you better, Floyd, you know, then you can kind of line up. No, this is also a call. This is a call to get yourself together because of what God has done for you. And when I used to work with the young folk upstairs, I would, I would often, trying to paint a picture the best I could, say, just imagine if your loved one, whoever it was that's so dear to you, was to give themselves away for your death row sentence. Your death row sentence. I mean, it, it don't work like that, but imagine you, you are guilty and you're on death row and it's your time to get the needle, to get the sleepy shot. And mama or granny, big mama, whoever said, hold up, let me do this for you. So the proper response is to give your life away because of what she did for you. 
Are y'all feeling me this morning? And that's all Paul is trying to plead with them, is that, listen, look at what God done for you. And see, grace and mercy also suggest that you were guilty, and you don't deserve this. That's big. So he's calling you, he's pleading with you, he's urging you that as you give yourself away, let your point of reference be the mercies and grace of God. God's grace and mercy also includes his, his uh, unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. The, his very presence in your life. God is with you never to leave you or forsake you. Not only is he up there, or out there, or back there, or down there, but he's here. And we, here, we live so unconscious that, then think about it, we, Lord, will not you come down and fix this? Well, if you're conscious that the Lord is already here, just live your life so he can fix it. <laughs> Lord, come in and make me forgive him. You know, I know forgiveness is of the devil. Lord, you show sure is busy. That kind of stuff. you just unconscious that the, that the great forgiver is already with you and in you. And then all his, it also includes peace and joy and power, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, security, forgiveness, salvation, reconciliation, justification, sanctification, liberation, and his unification. All that's included in God's great mercies and, and, and his graciousness. And the Apostle Paul is saying, now, y'all done forgot, y'all done lost y'all way. Y'all busy coming to church still living like hellions. And you're trying to be religious and keep the law. But let me just remind you, therefore, and what I learned in English, and many of us probably aren't even paying attention, but if you, in English and grammar day, what I always tell you as a rule, when you see a therefore, ask yourself, what is the therefore, therefore? <laughs> and so I thought that was key when Paul said, therefore, brethren, so the question was, you know, well, what is he talking about? Well, let's go back and look at what he said God has done for us. So if God has been good to you in any kind of way, and he has, therefore you ought to present yourself. That brings me to my next point. So there's, there, there's your motivation. Your motivation got to be right. You can do things that are not necessarily bad with the wrong motivation and still not honoring and pleasing to God. That's religion. That's what many of us do. Come to church, don't want to be here. Come to church looking at the clock. When are you going to sit down and shut up? You know, y'all know what we do. I'm just saying. <laughs> but your motivation is wrong. I don't care if, if, I, if, if my presentation is as dry as a brand new napkin. <laughs> if you're ready to go, it ain't my fault. <laughs> so God is saying, check your motivation if you want to be pleasing and, and, and giving an us acceptable sacrifice unto God. So that's my next point. He says, therefore, brethren, because of God's mercies, present yourself. Present yourself, Jeff. Yeah. What does that mean? That simply means to, to make yourself an, an open exhibit. To yield. We talked about it this morning. To yield yourself. And so we ain't said nothing about no money and, you know, and God done blessed me and I got two new cars. We ain't said none of that. <laughs> he says to yield, to present yourself, to place yourself at God's disposal. Did y'all catch that? We say it all the time, I give myself away, and don't really realize what we're saying. But God said, that's what I mean. I don't mean singing a song. I mean for you, out of my great mercy of you, to give yourself to me. Let me, let me come this way. You got to make a decision to say, Lord, here I am. <laughs> Lord, you know, it's so hard, you know, and, and, you know, and my flesh is, my, you know, it's, it's so weak, but I'm willing. But he's saying, I, I get all that, but as your motivation is because of his great mercies, you are to present yourself. And presenting yourself is, an, is simply an act of faith. You might not even know uh, specifically what God's specific will is for your life, but that's not even the point. The point is that because of God's grace, great mercy and because of his unmerited favor and because of his grace, you simply say, Lord, here I am. Whatever your will is, here I am. It also suggests, watch this now, it also suggests that it's a, a selfless, uninhibited act. Now that might sound all cute, but what does that mean? It, it, it simply means that, that you can't live your life selfishly like many of us do, and inhibited like many of us do. Here we go, I, you know, I wanna do what I feel. 
And, and, and when, when, when God is calling you to sacrifice and you base your life on how you feel, you'll never sacrifice. Because sacrifice don't mean comfort. Y'all missed that. You, you can never be a sacrifice if your life is based on how you feel. Because the word sacrifice carries with the idea of pain, to stretch yourself, to be inconvenient. So in that word presentation, it also carries with the idea of being selfless. Being uninhibited. Yeah. Let me just come at it this way. T to live your life like Jesus. We worship and oh, you know, I just want to conform to the image of Christ. Really. Christ gave himself away even unto the cross. Now see how we be tripping. God ain't called us to go to the cross. He has called us to give ourselves to him as a living sacrifice. Don't want to come to church because I'm going to miss the game. Come on now. Amen lights. <laughs> don't want to stay with Teresa because she don't act right. <laughs> don't want to come to church because Pastor Charles is going to charge me up. Yeah. Now I got to say nothing. I'm talking to myself too. I'm talking about I'm living like Christ. Christ gave us the ultimate example of what it means to live as a sacrifice. <laughs> All right, let me move on. Y'all ain't going with me. <laughs> Present yourself. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean pre present your mind or, you know, uh, your emotions? Well, that word means present your total being. Your body, soul, and spirit. Your mind, emotions, and your will. Everything. Y'all catch that? I ain't talking about this, oh, honey, I love you, you know. Well, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to, I don't want to, I'm just going to do what the Lord says. Everything to make you a person. God said, I want that. I don't want your ritualistic offerings. We come up here, we sing, we smile. Oh, bless the Lord. I don't, I don't want that. I want you. There's a place in the Old Testament where he said, uh, I'm looking for a sincere worshiper. So that means that some stuff can be false too. He said, but I want you. I want the whole you. I want the vessel, and I want the you that's inside the vessel. We missed that. We were saying it this morning, many of us live so unconscious of who we are and what we are. We are made in the image of God. We are spirit beings. The real, y'all don't see me. Y'all just see the house I live in. And I don't really see y'all. I, I got an image of what y'all look like looking through your eyes. The eyes are the gateway to your soul. But, but you are much more than your brain matter and flesh and blood. And God wants your flesh and blood, and he wants your spirit man. He wants your talents, he wants your gifts, he wants your money, he wants your time. He wants all of you. See how we do? And we think we're doing something when we come to church and have worship time for 30 minutes. That's good, but you, you offer up little songs and we do these things and have revival meetings, but, but all along life's way, we never give our total being to him. And so Paul was pleading with them, y'all quit doing that. Rose Terrace, let's quit doing that. If we're going to experience an abundant kingdom kind of life, we can't do that until or unless we give our total selves to God. Now what does that mean? If you're going to give yourself totally to God, that means God must be in control. <laughs> I can say I'm giving myself away, but if I'm still on the throne of my heart, I ain't gave myself away yet. Are y'all tracking with me? <laughs> Believers are to commit their entire being to God for his service and his service alone. That's big. Th this carries with the idea of priestly duties. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but, but in the Old Testament, those uh, Levite priests and those priests, it wasn't about uh, giving uh, God what kind of offering that, that, that they thought God would deserve. They were to give God the first fruits, not some lame goat, some, you know, a healthy goat. So for us, we, we can't be giving God no leftovers and think we're doing something. <laughs> well, you know, I got to work and I'll do it when I can. God ain't call you to go to the cross. I mean, but, but, you know, everybody got to work. How much you tired? <laughs> All right. The body cannot be committed to service without your mind. That's why he wants your total being. That's... Think about it now. 
you talking about you're giving your life to the Lord, but your mind and your emotions, you're all troubled. You haven't given your total self away. Because the mind controls the body. You can't give yourself, your body to God without giving him your mind. <laughs> and you ain't going to give him your mind without giving him your spirit. <laughs> so we need revival. <laughs> Number three, it ain't going to take me long. So check your motivation, and your motivation ought to inspire you unto the right kind of presentation. And then you need to check your consecration. Now that, that sounds good. I just use those words to keep me in, in, in a framework. But all that's simply saying is that if you're really going to live the abundant kingdom life, it's about making and declaring and dedicating your total being to God. Not some resolution, I'm going to do better this year, Ed, than I did last year. That's great. We ought to strive to do better. But doing better is different from dedicating and consecrating your total being. Consecration also carries with the same idea of sacrificing. It ain't got nothing to do with when you can. <laughs> it ain't got everything to do with, with you committing, making, declaring. As a, ma a matter of fact, that carries with the idea of some personal agency on your part. That's something you got to do. Lord, help me to commit. Lord, somehow make me want to give myself to you. No, that's something you got to do. Got nothing to do with your feelings. There are times where I ain't feeling doing good stuff. And I often say, just as an Ill illustration, sometimes, and, and it's mutual, sometimes I ain't feeling Teresa. We can have a little what, what not. I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't feeling her. But I'm committed to her, and I go home. <laughs> I'm consecrated to my relationship with her. So despite how I feel, I'm totally giving myself away to my relationship. Does that make sense? <laughs> so God is requiring no less than that. He says that you need to consecrate yourself. And how are you to consecrate yourself? This is big. As a living sacrifice. Now, if you don't get anything else out of my presentation, let's try to get this. Paul contrasts the living sacrifice to those dead sacrifices of the Old Testament. You go back and check it out, them bulls and goats, by the time they hit the altar, they, they, were, they were dead. <laughs> they were dead. In stark contrast to the substitutionary and ritualistic dead offerings of the Old Testament, God is saying that we are to offer ourselves living sacrifices. Watch this. <laughs> the Old Testament, those death sacrifices were to be burned up and disposed of for God's will. As living sacrifices, we ought to give ourselves so we can burn for God while we are alive. Y'all missed that. That was good. That was good to me. <laughs> we ought to present our, our whole self while we're alive, y'all. And whereas the Old Testament sacrifice will burn up and the ashes and whatnot, God is saying that we ought to give ourselves totally so we can burn. We can light it up. I'm the light of the world. I'm the salt of the earth. Anybody seen the burn of your life? Anybody seen the light burning in your life? That's what we're after. And I know you being dead. I mean, your, your total being, the, 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 the life that's in your spirit and the biological life that's in your body. I was telling Xavier, you know, uh, you got skills on the court. God wants that too. I'm not saying that maybe you need to go out and have time and pre present a message. Maybe God will have that, but it's, I'm not talking about that. But everything that you got, God wants as a living sacrifice. <laughs> we ought to present our whole self, our will, our vitality, our physical energy, our mind, our faculties. We sang the song, all my dreams, all my plans, Lord, I place them in your hand. <laughs> that's what we're saying. And God said, that's what I want. <laughs> and watch this. And, and what's at the core of that plea, that uh, beseechment, is that he wants you no longer to claim yourself. Why? Watch this. Now, when the, uh, now, now, granted, animals don't have an intellectual thought process like we do. Like they do react according to instinct. But uh, when they are dead, they didn't have, <laughs> have no choice in the matter. They, they didn't have no will in the matter to whether they was going to get put on the altar or not. I'd imagine if they were alive and they got felt that heat, they'd go the other way. <laughs> 
But God is saying, you are alive. I want you to make a conscious decision. I want you to release your will. Everything within you that's saying, even right now, I hear what you're saying, but I ain't trying to do that. I've been serving God my whole life, and I'm still stuck here. And they still treat me this way, and it just still ain't adding up. And I'm just working, I'm just struggling, and I just can't. God is saying, but, but still, think about my mercies. Think about my grace, and I want, and, and, and just remember, and I want you, and as a consequence, I want you to give your total self, surrender your will to him. God is not going to violate your will. God ain't going to never make you do what's right. And I was sharing with the, with the group this morning, I kind of chuckled, I ain't criticizing, but I am making a critical observation. Many of us brothers, probably ladies too, that's what we, that's what we mess up most of the time. Lord, as soon as I get myself together, then I'm going to get back in church. What is that? Yeah. It's, as soon as, you know, I got a few, you know, uh, Robert, I got a few things I'm trying to get worked out, and when I get, and then I get myself together. Hi, well, if you're going to get yourself together, what you need God for? <laughs> Y'all hear what I'm saying? <laughs> so God is saying, I'm the one that's going to fix this for you. You just got to trust me and remember and give your total being to me. That's what we have to. And so as a consequence, he wants to use our lives to burn. Just like those old sacrifices burn up, God wants to use our lives, our living sacrifices, that we might burn in this dark world. And the source of that burning flame is simply where we started, where Paul bases uh, his plea on, is the love and the gratitude and the appreciation for what God has done. When everything else is failing you, when everything else is giving you cause to quit or giving you pause to be apprehensive, the love and the mercy and the grace of God ought to burn you. You ought to be so inundated and so lit up and so burnt up with the love and mercy and grace and compassion of God that, you know, people all say, what in the world is wrong with him? He broke, he had been fired twice, he's addicted to alcohol, pornography, women, strip club, what, 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 but what's going on with him? I'm on fire, you know. <laughs> this also includes your time, your talents, your treasures, your relationships. Now, now granted, maybe I don't have to say this to Rose Terry, but since I got it on my outline, I'm going to say it. Uh, this is not to be uh, confused with some of the stuff that many folk would have us to think. With well, everything I got, I just give to the Lord. I, you know, I just give my call away to the man I saw on the street, you know. No, well, you know, I just, you know, I, God just moved on me. I, I just gave my whole checkbook to the homeless people. I'm being facetious, but, but I'm just saying. I, I, love, I love God. You love God? You know, and I just do this. God is not concerned about it. He don't want your self-debasement. He don't want your, your it's just me and God. You know, I got to pull away from folks sometimes. God don't want your isolationism. You get yourself in trouble isolating yourself. <laughs> God don't want you to, you know, be a minimalist. You know, I just, all I need is God. I don't need no house. Child, I don't need no clothes. You know, I don't need no food. God gonna take care of me. Yeah, but if that's your motivation, God don't want that either. See how we do? And walk around thinking that we got it going on. And folk, folk, rather than looking at us as peculiar people, folks saying them folk are crazy and lost their mind. And wonder, well, you know, I just, I just pray for folk, and, and people just don't want to come to the Lord these days. Well, shoot. If it means acting like you and looking like you, you know. <laughs> I'm become either. So your consecration means to give yourself as a living sacrifice. And you can't give yourself a living sacrifice any kind of way either. I said over in point two, you know, God, God wasn't pleased with them, with them jokers. They wanted to keep the good sheep for them. I, I'm giving God something. You know, sheep got, you know, one eye and got, you know, three legs. And that's, that's, I gave him something. And God said, no, you, know, you don't do me that way either. Don't give me your leftovers. You done worked all the week. D done worshiped your child and give him all your money. <laughs> you know, you done worship your spouse and, and oh, I got to rest today. God understand, Kenneth. Yeah, he, yeah, he understands. <laughs> and God said, you need to give yourself away in a certain kind of manner. And the first thing he says in that verse is you need to give yourself away to him wholly. 
now here again, and I, and I probably don't have to say this in Rose Terry, but I'm going to say it because I wrote it down. Holy don't mean that we got some kind of glow about us, you know, I'm floating on the cloud or something. Some kind of, y'all know how we do. We think when we start talking about the Holy Spirit, we get all spooky. Yeah, you know, y'all know what I'm saying. And all he's saying, when you, when you give yourself away holy, holy at, 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 at its core just simply means that you are set apart. You are set aside totally and only for God without any kind of defects. That's what that means. It don't mean, you know, uh, I just feel holy. What, what is that? No, God said you set yourself aside. Everything that's in you is only for God's purpose. In your marriage. Yeah, 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 yeah your body's not your own. And y'all are one flesh and all of that. But at, at, at the core, you set yourself aside in that relationship for God's purpose. It, this was meant with a literal and physical point of reference, just like I said with, with those animals in the Old Testament. It, meant, it is meant literally and physically for the believer in the New Testament. Everything that makes you who you are, everything, you are to set it aside, not just, not just Sunday. You know, Sunday is the holy day, y'all. And I'm going to do God's stuff on Sunday or maybe on the other side. You know, well, you know, the Saturday the Sabbath, so every Saturday is the holy. Now, <laughs> every day and every part of your life is to be set aside, set apart for God's purpose. Put it uh, in the simple forms, you just need to live godly. <laughs> See, that, that's all that means. And I might add, in, in, uh, parenthetically, you can live godly because God is in you. I know we don't want, want, want to look at that because that, not to me, we got to make some choices. You don't want to forgive him, but you can. <laughs> you, you, you don't want to exercise the spirit of reconciliation that Christ gave you, but you can. You know, trying to dump stuff back in God's lap. Lord, I need your help. In the same breath, Lord, you are my ever-present help in my time of need. But what you begging for? <laughs> Live holy. Be ye holy. That's what the book said. Then he goes on to say uh, something that's connected with being holy is uh, being an acceptable sacrifice. That ain't difficult either. That's just simply something that God is pleased with. Now that's big, so it suggests for us that some of the stuff we do, God ain't even pleased with. We all polished and plastic. God don't want no polished plastic. God wants the real you. <laughs> Acceptable means that you give him, you give yourself to him in a manner which he's fully agreeable with. He's fully pleased with. The only kind of consecration or sacrifice or offering that's pleasing to God. Is what he wants and what he requires. That's not to say that this stuff is bad or stuff is unto hell or stuff, stuff is demonic. Some of it could be. But for example, just like with the praise team, I've been really trying to be intentional in talking about this when we have our teaching time. It's a good thing to sing songs. We need to know the words. And you know, and, 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 you know, and our posture ought to be right and all of that. But if, if, if the motivation ain't right, if this part down here ain't right, as polished as we might be at times, that's still unacceptable. Let's just, let's, let's just be specific with it. Go ahead and get your new suit, men. Ladies, get your new dress. Roll your arms and hallelujah. Do all of that stuff. But if this stuff ain't right, God ain't pleased with your religion. <laughs> God, is not pleased, God is not pleased with your religion. God don't want your ritualism. God don't want, your, don't want our emotionalism. God don't want our churchism. I made that one up. <laughs> Come many of us, and I'm, just, and I'm not making excuses for it, but many of us have been steeped in churchism. We know the church language. We know the church posture, you know. And, you know, we, we, you know, we done ch churched ourselves to death. God don't want your, your churchism. God wants you in the way he wants you. God don't want our programs. That's why I appreciate pastors so much. And, and, and I must admit, like everybody else, I had issues with it earlier. But I didn't understand. How come we can't, you know, sell no fish? How come we can't have no fish fry at least? Everybody else selling baskets. God don't want none of that. God wants you. <laughs> now, that ain't one of them kind of deal where you can go to hell for it. But the point is, 
programs, especially if it ain't from the right place, that ain't pleasing to God. <laughs> God wants the believer to give themselves totally back to him for his service. Not our one-sided prayers. Think about it. Even we praying for revival. And I'm not criticizing. I'm just making a, a, a critique. Many of our prayers are one-sided. Lord, give me. Lord, you know what I need. Lord, do it. And then we come up here, I give myself away. What about having a dialogue with God? Getting still, picking that book up so he can tell you what he wants from you. Right. Talking about revival, right? We're talking about revival. His desire is to give ourselves away to him, to serve him. Not out of obligation, but out of gratitude. <clears throat> and then as I close this point, so I can finish up, he goes on to say, he wants, it, it ought to be a reasonable act of service. And some translations say a reasonable act of worship. And real quickly, for me, for a long time, I thought that meant, well, God had been so good to me, the least I could do is just serve him. You know, that's the reasonable thing I could do is to serve him. That's, you know, that's the least I could do. But that's not what that means. <laughs> that word comes from the word logos, the word. And that means to have a, a rational intent an intellectual decision about what you do. You might say, well, 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 I mean, okay, why is that important? As I said, when I pointed back to the animals that were being sacrificed, <laughs> uh, it ain't funny, but you can find humor in it. When they were being sacrificed, they didn't have no rhyme or reason for what they were getting burned up for. <laughs> in other words, they didn't have no choice in the matter. They didn't have no decision in the matter. So God is saying, I want to sacrifice where you decide by an act of your will because of how good I am to you to give yourself away to me. Now look at us. <laughs> Talking about I love the Lord, but I'm just struggling to trust him with my life. Well, I got to work, Robert. Well, what I'm supposed to be a doormat? Well, he, that's not even his concern. He wants your rational thought process, your, your, your conscious decision to say, Lord, here I am. Anything else is ritualistic, religion, and you're not no animal, you're not a dog, you're not a bull, you're not a goat, you're not a basket of fruit. You can make a decision. <laughs> and it go hand in hand, you know, and it could say even more so, maybe we don't even know God. God forbid, I mean, why? that's all Paul is saying. I mean, if you're in a relationship with God and you're experiencing this gracious, merciful God, the natural and supernatural response is to give yourself away to him because he's been so good. Nothing else. And I was sharing with one of my partners at work uh, this week. I was saying, uh, one of the ladies at work, rather. I had to think about it. In, in an ideal situation, you know, we're not, not perfect in our humanity, but I'm saying in an ideal situation when, when children can sense that their parents love them without even, you know, having to go into a prayer, in a prayer meeting to be obedient, you know, to, to have a, you know, didactical study. Th their response is to do what's pleasing to their mom and daddy. Y'all yeah. yeah. catch that? Yeah. That's an another lesson. You know, a lot of times our kids could be, be, uh, be a major reflection on us because they're so rebellious. <laughs> like Jesus, believers are to live total lives consecrated and set aside for God's service. I mean, Jesus said that he came to do his father's will, not his will. Everything that Jesus did, he didn't stutter, stammer, equivocate, doubt, and back up, and go forward, move side to side. It was all about, I came to do my Father's will. Even unto death. And we struggle with living an abundant kingdom, resurrected, powerful life. And I'm just simply arguing us today, it's, it's, it's very likely because we ain't giving ourselves away. You see what happened to Jesus? He gave himself away and he got raised again on the third day. And then, as I draw to a close, he said this should be our reasonable act of service. So some translations say worship. Now, I, I thought this was big uh, because that word service or worship, depending on what book you're looking at, it points directly to one being a priest. That's big to me because a lot of us don't realize it and a whole lot of us don't want to recognize it. You, we, Pastor, he's a preacher. Oh, Brother Andre, he's associate minister. I mean, granted, those are formal titles within our local ministry. But y'all preach too. <laughs> you looking at Pastor Charles, looking at me, well, you know, ooh, I can't believe he did that. Well, you got the same standard too. <laughs> 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 
You might not, that's what it is. God says that we are a holy priesthood. Every one of y'all, every one of us. And so when you think of the priesthood in the context of the Old Testament, God set aside priests, particularly those Levites, to offer up the sacrifice. It couldn't just anybody go up into the Holy of Holies and offer you and do all this stuff. So God is saying to us, you need to see yourself at, as the priest that you are. All Christians and believers are what I call believer priest. <laughs> and that, that may not resonate well with you, but I'm suggesting to you, until you see yourself, who you, how you really are, until you know who you are, then all that stuff we try and do, we'll, I mean, we'll, we'll never get there, folks. We'll never get there. Like Jesus, the ultimate high priest who offered himself even unto death, we ought to do no less. Believers offering ourselves the living sacrifices as, a divi as divine property. That carries with I did that whole consecration thing. You got to see yourself as divine property. You don't own yourself anymore. And then service and worship is synonymous. And, and I'll condense this. I, I can come to a close. And, and I'm only using this example because this resonated with me. Did you not know much of this stuff that we do in the name of worship ain't worship to begin with? You really want to talk about worshiping God, replace that word worship with service. Let me just be candid with you. Your singing, our singing ain't worship. Now see, now that'll mess some of us up. I love music. Probably more than many of us, but, but singing a song don't mean worship. Singing can be a means by which you express worship, but come up here and sing and cry and get happy. I'm not, I'm not criticizing, I'm saying that you could be coming from the right place, but, but I'm just saying so we'll know. Let's stop getting all twisted and excited over stuff that God ain't looking at. Your singing ain't worship. Worship don't start and originate in singing. Worship don't start and originate in laying down flat on the floor prostrate. All of those things can be means by which you express your worship, but are not worship. Even giving your money. Go and give your money because you know I ain't getting this money. That ain't worship. Giving your money can be in, uh, a means by which you express your worship. So why am I I'm not harping on that? Worship originates from your inner man, from your relationship with God. That's it. That's it. Worship, and I put it in my terms, is simply giving yourself away. That's it. Worship doesn't originate in the external religious rituals. Worship doesn't originate in singing. It doesn't originate in just giving token gifts. It doesn't originate, I have, uh, and I'm digressing, but I have one dear brother of mine was telling me uh, when we were doing the, uh, uh, the mass choir situation, I won't call it a name, you know, but, you know we got to do stuff in a certain key. Because you do, if you do it in A flat or whatever, that usher in the presence of God. Wow. wow. So I can live my life full of hell and hellishly all the week long, all the year, but when I hit an A flat, oh, here I come to worship. For real. And then, <laughs> here we go. Worship, listen y'all, worship is an activity that originates, I love this word, that originates from uh, our knowledge and consciousness of the Holy God's presence in us. You, you listen, I'm going to stand for you, I'm going to say it. You can't worship God if you don't know him. How could you? How, how can you worship a God that you will have no conscientiousness of? You're not even conscious that he's here. In your mind, he at the church between 8.30 and 1 o'clock. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> That's why you can't wait to get to church. Then pastor all ain't preaching, you ain't going to come. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> but you, you can't. So the, the point is, <laughs> you have to be totally conscious and aware of this God we claim to be excited about when we have them four, little, four and a half minutes singing them songs. 
And I tell Fred all the time, I say, you know, don't get me wrong, I love certain songs. I like the groove and all of that. But being conscious of the groove ain't worship. <laughs> Loving how beautiful the lyrics are, that ain't worship. But them lyrics in that song ought to be a means by which you express your worship because you know God. <laughs> and lastly, as I close this last point and sit down, after we check our motivation and our consecration, and uh, uh, it's all about, at the end, our transformation. He says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says, not to conform. That simply means, and that's also, some commentaries say that it's passive in the sense that you're not conforming to this world is action be beyond your participation. In other words, God, I don't, I don't want to be a drunk no more. Fix it. Let, let me sit down, and when I wake up in the morning, I ain't drinking no more. Wow. I ain't got to do nothing. I'm just praying. But, but other commentaries suggest that because of your consciousness of this God in you, yeah. you actively participate yeah. in not being conformed to this world. <laughs> so he's saying, don't be conformed to this world. Don't be shape the fashion. Don't pattern yourself after this world. And it also don't mean world in the sense of cosmos. It means world in, in the sense of this world's standards. Did y'all catch that? In other words, this world's culture, the normalities of this world. Y'all know what's normal. We ain't got to talk. Y'all know what's normal in this world today. Rugged individualism. I got mine. You get yours. I got, I got Jesus, you get Jesus, you know. The, the homosexual agenda. Well, you know, some, I mean, well, God did create everybody, you know, and God wants everybody to be loved, don't he? You know, I'm just saying, you know, uh, success. Success in this world means it's you by yourself and you get all the money in the world. All, all this stuff, you know. He said, don't, you, you stop it. Not ask God to do magic but you stop being conformed to this world. Right. Amen, lights. <laughs> right. Go ahead and pray to God that he would uh, become more aware in your spirit, but God, go ahead and ask God to, to somehow make you quit being conformed without any activity on your part. You're gonna continue to be conformed to this world. <laughs> so he says, you are not to be conformed to this world. You are to stop yourself. In it, some as I learned in English, and anytime you don't see a subject at the front, the understood subject is what? You. He said, you stop being conformed to this world. <laughs> you stop allowing this world's norm conform to you, even in church. Well, you know, they, it's okay to do certain kind of praise dances and do certain kind of songs. Stop being conformed to this world. <laughs> and so he says, and, and as opposed to being conformed to this world, you be transformed. Metamorphosis. Y'all seen... Uh, a butterfly that used to be a worm, that's a total change. That's a drastic, dramatic change in form and transfiguration. It's the same word they use when they said Jesus was up on the mountain of transfiguration. He changed forms. I don't know what that looked like, but the point is in our lives, when we show up, people should see a change in form in our lives. That's big. I'm going to say hallelujah to myself. <laughs> You ought to be so transformed where there's a drastic change in your life. So much so to where everywhere you go, your transformation ought to be influencing the world that you used to be conformed to. By the way, this is an imperative. God is not asking you when, when you get yourself together, you know, when, when I, you know, kind of get a little red because I'm tired. No, God is saying because of all of my great mercies and all of the things Paul outlined and so much more, you get your motivation in the right place. He said, this is an imperative. And, and it's not a one-time imperative either. He says, as you live this life, as you live out your spiritual life in the natural, you ought to do this ongoing from the time you become conscious that Christ is in you until the time you transition and take off these clothes. It's ongoing action. This is imperative for us to continue personal action and responsibility. As, as, the, as the believers, we are to ourselves stop. That is to say, stop in cooperation with the Spirit of God. Because in and of yourself, you can't do it. But, but there is some action required on your part. 
And as you stop being conformed to this world, you ought to do your part in being transformed. That's a whole other message, but you can't be transformed apart from the word. Uh, like Pastor, how many of us have a, a conscious, a, a consistent diet of the word? Mm. What's your top 12? What's your top two? <laughs> how many times do you pick up your Bible before you come to church Sundays or Tuesdays? Yeah. Talking about transformed life. <laughs> Not that transformation doesn't need outside or divine agency, but the point is that our action is necessary. And then as I close this point out, transformed into what? Into who? Transformed into the image of Christ, into kingdom people, into people that live an abundant kingdom life. And you notice in my little presentation, I ain't said nothing about money yet. That's, that's a given, but that ought not be our first point of reference. The first point of reference, I'll be seeking the kingdom. And as you live kingdom people, we got a, a gracious, good king who owns everything. And as you live according to the kingdom rules, if you will, our gracious king will take care of all the good subjects. So living a life of service as priest to God is what he's after. Not merely expecting to receive, but to motivate, to be motivated to give because of God's grace and mercy. And as I close this point, and then I'll get my conclusion, I'm done. I'll finish by reading a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. Okay. Dr. Martin Luther King, in his, uh, in his book, Strength to Love, he said, talking about this same scripture, he said that we ought to be transformed nonconformist. Yes, what did that mean? Right. We ought to be nonconformist in that anything that this world pitched to us, no matter how good it looked, well, shoot, or even right, how good it might be, sin is good for a season. We ought to be nonconformists, just like Jesus didn't allow people to put him in a box into this world. That he didn't allow them to, 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 to change his pattern, his direction. But on the flip side, because of his transformation, he changed everything and everywhere he went. So in his book, Strength of Love, this is what Dr. King said. We are called to be people of conviction, not conformity, of moral nobility, not social respectability. Too many of us want folks to pat us on the back. I don't went to school all my life and they don't, they don't see my degree. Well, that's so sad, too bad. <laughs> well, you know, I done been at this ministry so long and pastor won't let me serve. I mean, your point of reference is wrong. Every true Christian is a citizen of two worlds, the world of time and the world of eternity. As Christians, we must never surrender our supreme loyalty to any time-bound custom on earth or any earth-bound idea. For at the heart of our universe is a higher reality that simply is the kingdom of God to which we must be conformed. We must make a choice. We will continue to march to the drumbeat of conformity or respectability, or we will listen to the beat of a more distant drumbeat, which is the saving music of eternity unto the kingdom of God. That's Martin Luther King. So in conclusion, where I started, I, I asked, do we need revival? I think so. I know so. Perhaps as this pastor said this last week, I don't know if, if, if we remember, the pastor said something to the effect, you know, maybe it's the cares of this world. Maybe it's our own messed up mind. Maybe it's the words of this world. Uh, maybe it's even religion or churchism that has choked out the word of, out of our lives. And as a consequence, we are keeping ourselves from experiencing the abundant kingdom life. Or perhaps the cares of this world or the weed of this world has Maybe literally choked us out. Y'all watch wrestling. When somebody get choked out, they are rendered unconscious. So maybe you're trying to reach and grab and religiousize your way to a kingdom of abundant living, but, but that's not, that's not going to work. You have to be revived in order to experience the consciousness of God, to be awakened unto a kingdom life, which is a life of service. May God bless you and God keep you.